and today we're going to be talking about fly fishing line, fly fishing leader, fly fishing tippets, uh, fly tip fishing backing. Talk about basically everything that goes into that, any kind of fly line system. So let's get started with number one, the fly line. We're going to talk about the floating line. Let's say, when am I going to use my floating line? I'm going to use it anytime I can. When I can. What do I mean when I can? There are going to be days where it's uh, extremely windy or choppy water or a turbulent surf. In calmer conditions to moderate conditions, you're fishing between, I'm fishing between, say, zero. 15 feet of water. You can throw it anywhere in uh, the surf, you can throw it in bays, and you can throw it in inlets. Surface flies, you definitely want to be using a floating line. It just floats. Uh, that's the difference between floating and sinking line, is that it floats. I, you know, longer leaders, um, you're looking uh, minimum six feet uh, up to 15 plus feet. But if there's one line I'm going to pick, it, uh, it's going to be on the top of my list, I'm going to pick the floating line if I could choose one line. It's just fun using the floating line. Now we're going to talk about sinking line. You're looking at deeper water, of course, it gets you down quicker. On rougher days, uh, windy days, ripping current, um, so it's for deeper presentations. I also think the sinking line is more of a level presentation. Uh, what does that mean, level? In other words, that sinking line will sink and your fly is behind it. So you're working your flies more so on a level plane. While the floating line, your line is floating. So your leader, pretend this is floating line, so your line is on top, but your leader is going to be down. When you work that fly in, it kind of comes up on the retreat. If you see what I mean. I've been ripping current. Uh, anything, any, any, any condition where it's going to be a little terminalist, I'm going to go with the sinking line. And also, the big one is I am working that sinking line in uh, rougher conditions. Uh, if there's going to be uh, a big surf, you know, if I'm working a surf, uh, windy days, uh, choppy water, uh, and of course, uh, if I'm looking for a deeper presentation. But I will, this is the primary factor, is uh, the rough days out. That, it's more dense, it's going to cut the wind, it's going to cut the water, and that's when I'm going to be using my sinking line. A lot of times on the surf, when I, I can't uh, get my fly line to cooperate and get under the waves because of the wind or the big break in the surf, it cuts the wind better, it gets under the water better, and there are two types of sinking line, and we're going to get to that now. I'm showing two, these are both sinking lines. This one's considered what they call a full sink. You can see it's all brown. Uh, this one, they would call, uh, I would call a sinking tip line. And you can see the front portion of this line it, it will sink. Sorry, about the tangle here. The front portion of this line will sink. And it terminates somewhere over here. What's makes this advantageous is you get that aspect of a floating line and the casting capabilities of a sinking line with the characteristics of a floating line above it. Uh, what does that mean? Um, it makes it easier to lift your line up off the water. I find myself using the, the sinking tip line definitely more often than a bow. Now your sinking lines aren't all the same. You're going to have fast and slow. That's and something on the label. Well, we're going to get into this, but um, IPS, 
and that's inches per second. That's as fast as it drops. It's almost like calling it a sinker. It's going to drop six inches per, per second in a closed environment. It's not going to drop six inches per second when you have current. So keep that in mind. Your six inches per second will turn into two inches per second in current. So your middle of the line, which a lot of people use, are going to say be between your two to four inches per second. Um, you're, you're faster, it's going to be rougher, and that's going to be your six plus, and then your slow sinking is going to be your one to two. Um, your one to two is going to lift easier than your faster, which is going to, of course, sink. But in any case, uh, you're going to have to learn to pick up and get familiar with what your lines do. The fly lines are all going to have some sort of taper to them. And these are the, the three basic tapers. Level taper, of course, is just a straight running section of line. Then over here you have, and I'll denote a level taper with an L. Um, your weight forward taper, I'm using the, the weight forward taper, oh, probably 80% uh, of the time. Uh, the weight forward taper you can see here, it has uh, uh, a belly and then two tapered sections and a little section over here. And I like to keep that section short, but uh, we're just getting into the basics. Um, so in other words, the weight of your line, the, 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 the actual weight, I call it the, the sinker section of your line, is in the front. So you're going to get that low quick, and that's denoted by something over here, weight forward, the WF. Double taper, find the double taper is good for shorter presentations and also uh, a lot of times night fishing or bigger flies. Um, you generally have more control of your line and that is denoted by a uh, simple DT. Then you have down here what they call a shooting head and you can actually make your shooting head with a double taper by cutting it in half. Um, but, uh, I think that a shooting head is pretty much of the same kind of line as a weight forward, the way that I use my lines. Um, but those are your three basic lines. So I'm using, if I would pick one line, the weight forward definitely would be it for a saltwater fly fishing. So in short, if you're new to fly fishing, look for a weight forward fly line. It's going to handle easier, it's going to cast better. Uh, I'm not going to get into things that I really do to it, but I will cut it down, really down to that button section, um, down to the taper. Uh, I think it just casts better like that. But play with your line and see what it does and let it age and then try doing fun stuff with it. Summarize the knots real quick. Your primary knot you want to learn is going to be your nail knot. And that's going to be to your fly line and your back end. The second type of knot is going to be your connection knot. And that knot generally is going to be from your back end uh, to your tip end. The third type, and I would like to use for that, would be a uh, either a uni or a lot of people like to use blood knots. The third type of knot you want to be want to learn is going to be your loop knot. And your loop knot basically is uh, going to be to your either the tip top, if you don't, to your nail knot, or it's going to go to your uh, tip of your leader. Um, and the loop knot, I like to use a perfection loop, um, but you can use any loop that you like. Something like that. Anyway. Uh, the fourth type of knot uh, is, of course, going to be to your fly. And I like a plain old clinch knot or a, a loop style knot. And for that, I like the unit knot. But any loop knot will do. And you can look up these knots online. I just want to keep this shorter than need be. Fly line, so leader knots. And uh, there's three basic ones. The first one is going to be your nail knot, which is actually 
just a smell. The second one is going to be a loop, a braided loop. And the third one is going to be your nail knot, but we're going to drop, put a drop of aqua seal to that nail knot. Talking about knots, uh, I'm not going to show you the knots. You can look those up. But these are the knots that I'm going to be using. I'm, the number one knot that I use is uh, over here. Is going to be this is what they call a nail knot, and the nail knot is actually just the smell. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, you can do it by hand, actually. And what you're going to do is, you know how to smell. You can smell about 12 inches of line on the end of your leader. And, or they have, they make tools that they have. And I'll sometimes carry this in my pocket to make it quick and easier if I have to retie one out with you. Um, but you can do that by hand, and I do it by hand too. This just makes it quicker. And this is what they call braided loops. And I have some braided loops here. You can see. Uh, they're braided loops, and because it is braided line, hollow core, with a loop, you can see there's a loop on the end of that. And all you do is you slide that onto your fly line, and you put some, affix some seal, and you tighten it up there. And I'll use these, uh, they're on some of my lines, definitely not most, not my favorite way to do it. Uh, when you would use a braided loop is primarily perhaps if you were using a mono core line. Um, some lines you get, like this one here, you'll get a fly line and they'll actually come with a welded loop or somewhat what they call a welded loop on the end. Um, I generally will start, if I get a new line, this line I just started using. Um, I'm going to discuss this later, but I'll keep that loop on. But I do something else to my lines when I really like them. Now, if you watched any of my videos, you know that I like long leaders. And we're going to talk about leaders soon. Uh, this is one of my favorite lines. This is a Portland 444. I like this stuff because I know what I got and I know what I'm getting. Um, but this is basically a nail knot. Uh, this one got a, this is, I've been using that for two seasons now, so that's got to be changed. But this is a, a, a nail knot, and all I do is I affix a little drop of aqua seal on the end of that nail knot. A lot of times, if I'm working with the nail knot, which is here, I don't like, even if you trim them thin, sometimes they get bumpy over your guides. If I'm working with a long leader, that flows right through. And I generally we use, will use this system with the long leaders with floating line. Uh, my sink tip lines, or my sinking lines, as you can see here, I don't even bother because I'm only using, oh, I'll start with five feet, six feet of leader. And that leader is always above the line. But if you're playing a fish and you get them in and, and you're waist high in the water, you really have to, if you're using a 15 foot leader, you really gotta, you're gonna go past your, 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 your butt section of that leader. So that's gonna make those guides slide right through. And that connection is so smooth and silky that it will actually shoot through your guides as well. Um, so those are the basic fly line to leader connections that I like to use. So in this, now I'm gonna talk about the leader I like to use, and first and the simplest, I'm going to talk about for the sinking line. The leader I like to use for sinking line, uh, basically, is just monofilament line. Um, I'll generally work between, uh, say, 15 uh, to 30 pound test. This happens to be 25, I think. I'll start anywhere between four six feet of line and I found a good range of about three and a half feet. Uh, actually that line seems to work great. Uh, but I'm changing flies and I'm only going to start with six feet of line. For my floating line, I like a longer leader and you can make them short as well, but I generally will use uh, 
about six feet of 50 pound monofilament. And you can use a Unity Uni or a nail nod, uh, any connection knot that you want. And I will attach that to about 30 pound monofilament between four and five feet. And then to that, I will attach a 15 or so pound, you can call it tippet, with a loop on the end. And we'll show you that in a second. So I'm going to show you how I do it in a writer. This is our fly line here, and your fly line is going to have a loop. Um, generally, when I aqua seal those leaders on there, they're affixed to my fly line. But that you'll either use one of the three knots up there, and I will run a section as I show, say five to six feet of about 50 pounds. And I found this works great anywhere between, you know, between seven to 11 weight lines. Um, you can also use six. You want to use your connection knot here, which could be, a, I like to use it a, a uni to uni, so you can use a blood knot, uh, any knot that you want. The next section I'm running here, this is going to be running between four, and I'll go up to six feet, but we'll just say four to five feet. And at the end, you want to do your loop. And then to that loop, you make another loop. And this is going to be about three feet of your tippet that you use, which I like to start with 15 pounds. But uh, you can go whatever you need at eight. I generally will not go above 30 pounds if I'm on, up in the air, maybe 50 pounds. But uh, I would say 75% of the time, I'm using 15 pound test, and that's going to be your fly. Now keep in line, mind, you don't have to make them that big, but you can see generally you can run, and you, here you can go, you know, three to four feet, and this section you might want to go uh, two to three feet, and then over here, oh, you can run this uh, at least two feet to give you some change. So you can see the general trend. It, it, it's a slight taper going down, but it does turn that fly over well. So again, this is your connection knot. And this is going to be your uni or your, your uni or blood knot. Uh, and this will be your loop to loop. So this section here, you can work with trip after trip after trip, and you're just changing this section in here to fit your needs. So you can throw your eight pound leader, and you can bounce that up with the, you know, the 50 pound or whatever you want to use. It's all up to you. Now, if you're lucky, uh, <laughs> your fly line will hit what they call it, the back end, and it can be the most important or the least important part of your line system. It's a big spool, a 30 pound dandy. And this makes a great back end for most lines. A mono back end, I found, is very, very, very good. Uh, and I use that, oh, I use what I got, but I use that maybe on 70% of my spools. Uh, all your back end does, if you have that big running fish, you're going to get down to your back end, so you might need something that's soft on your hand. Like 30 pound test is going to be fairly soft. Um, they do use the braided lines. Um, another thing, type of mono. Uh, if you're in a store and you happen to see monofilament on sale, it's all just as good um, if you can get a dollar spool. Do test it if you get um, a lower end monofilament. Generally, I find their breaking strengths are on. Um, but the quality, the memory of a monofilament line um, doesn't matter because that line's going to be really, it's just there to, to hold that fish. Another thing I use is just braided line, and this is from my big game uh, chunkin' reel. When I change my line on my reels, uh, I put that old line aside 
And if you have, this is, oh, it's got to be 65 pound test at least. Just 1065 is soft on, on the hands. I'm not saying it's going to be all the time, so you're going to make sure it's, you know, you know what you're doing. You know, it could, could cut you, but I, I have no problem with that. Uh, as long as it's a thicker braid from an old reel, uh, 65, uh, 80 pound. Uh, you can use thinner braid, but just bear in mind when that line's ripping out, it can cut you like a saw. Um, so old braided line from old fishing reels, I will use for backing. I think the backing is the least yet most, could be on a great day, the most important part of your line system. So do pay mind to the back end that you decide to use. The, the, the back end knot that I like to use is just going to be your nail knot. I want to talk uh, briefly now about uh, night fishing or uh, glow fly lines. I started using this one. This is a glowing fly line. It's a floating glowing fly line. And if you fish at night, I found this thing, this uh, glowing line, uh, it's just incredible. Uh, your visibility and for your presentation, your distance, uh, your accuracy, uh, it's almost better than fishing in the day. The thing I do find is that dusk and most likely dawn, I don't think I made any dawn trips, but at dusk, it gets tricky because uh, there's that uh, glare and that glow that, you, you know, your regular fly line, you'll see better. But uh, after dusk, or be even before dusk, you can use it. Dusk, it, you can use it, but it gets a little tricky. And here, I think it's one of the most underappreciated tools uh, in fishing over the, the eons. It's the simple uh, nail clipper. Uh, all my bags, I have them on my waders. It's just a little simple nail clipper. I can go without pliers, I can go without a knife. But if I know I have that clipper on me, I don't have to walk back to the car. So that nail clipper is <laughs> probably the number one piece of equipment in any line or your section. And on that note, thanks for watching. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed the presentation. And have a good afternoon, night, day, evening, wherever you are. And uh, remember, all you